Chapter 8 What about us? Darwinian man, though well behaved, at best is only a monkey shaved. William S. Gilbert and Arthur Sullivan, Princess Ida In 1924, while dressing for a wedding, Raymond Dart was literally handed what would become the greatest fossil find of the 20th century. Dart was not only a young professor of anatomy at the University of Witwaterstrand in South Africa, but also an amateur anthropologist and had spread the word that he was looking for interesting finds to fill a new anatomy museum. As Dart was donning his tuxedo, the postman brought him two boxes of rocks containing bone fragments excavated from a limestone quarry near Tongs in the Transvaal region. In his memoir, Adventures with the Missing Link, Dart describes the moment. As soon as I removed the lid, a thrill of excitement shot through me. On the very top of the rock heap was what was undoubtedly an endocranial cast or mold of the interior of the skull. Had it been only the fossilized brain cast of any species of ape, it would have ranked as a great discovery, for such a thing had never before been reported. But I knew at a glance that what lay in my hands was no ordinary anthropoidal brain. Here in lime-consolidated sand was the replica of a brain, three times as large as that of a baboon, and considerably bigger than that of an adult chimpanzee. The startling image of the convolutions and furrows of the brain and the blood vessels of the skull were plainly visible. It was not big enough for primitive man, but even for an ape it was a big, bulging brain, and, most important, the forebrain was so big and had grown so far backward that it completely covered the hindbrain. Was there, anywhere among this pile of rocks, a face to fit the brain? I ransacked feverishly through the boxes. My search was rewarded, for I found a large stone with a depression into which the cast fitted perfectly. There was faintly visible in the stone the outline of a broken part of the skull and even the back of the lower jaw and a tooth socket, which showed that the face must be somewhere there in the block. I stood in the shade, holding the brain as greedily as any miser hugs his gold, my mind racing ahead. Here I was certain was one of the most significant finds ever made in the history of anthropology. Darwin's largely discredited theory that man's early progenitors probably lived in Africa came back to me. Was I to be the instrument by which his missing link was found? These pleasant daydreams were interrupted by the bridegroom himself tugging at my sleeve. My God, Ray, he said, striving to keep the nervous urgency out of his voice. You've got to finish dressing immediately, or I'll have to find another best man. The bridal car should be here any moment. The groom's concern is understandable. Nobody wants to discover on their wedding day that their best man is more interested in a box of dusty rocks than in the impending nuptials. Yet it's difficult not to sympathize with Dart as well. In The Descent of Man, Darwin had conjectured that our species had originated in Africa because our closest relatives, gorillas and chimpanzees, are both found there. But this was little more than a hunch. There were no fossils to back it up. And there was manifestly something of an evolutionary gulf between us and the common ancestor we must have shared with other great apes, an ancestor that was surely more ape-like than human. On that day in 1924, the first stepping stone was uncovered, showing that the gulf would eventually be crossed. There it was, in Dart's trembling hands, a direct glimpse of what had long before been simplistically dubbed the missing link. One wonders how he could have concentrated on his duties at the wedding. What Dart found in that box was the first specimen of what he later named Australopithecus africanus. Southern Ape Man. In the next three months, Dart's meticulous dissection of the rock, using sharpened knitting needles purloined from his wife, revealed the full face. It was the face of an infant, now known as the Tongs Child, complete with milk teeth and erupting molars, 
Its mixture of human and ape-like traits clearly confirmed Dart's idea that he had indeed stumbled upon the dawn of human ancestry. Since Dart's time, paleoanthropologists, geneticists, and molecular biologists have used fossils and DNA sequences to establish our place in the tree of evolution. We are apes descended from other apes, and our closest cousin is the chimpanzee whose ancestors diverged from our own several million years ago in Africa. These are indisputable facts, and rather than diminishing our humanity, they should produce satisfaction and wonder, for they connect us to all organisms, the living and the dead. But not everyone sees it that way. Among those reluctant to accept Darwinism, human evolution forms the core of their resistance. It doesn't seem so hard to accept that mammals evolved from reptiles or land animals from fish. We just can't bring ourselves to acknowledge that, just like every other species, we too evolved from an ancestor that was very different. We've always perceived ourselves as somehow standing apart from the rest of nature. Encouraged by the religious belief that humans were the special object of creation, as well as by a natural solipsism that accompanies a self-conscious brain, we resist the evolutionary lesson that, like other animals, we are contingent products of the blind and mindless process of natural selection. And because of the hegemony of fundamentalist religion in the United States, this country has been among the most resistant to the fact of human evolution. In the famous Monkey Trial of 1925, high school teacher John Scopes went on trial in Dayton, Tennessee, and was convicted for violating Tennessee's Butler Act. Tellingly, this law didn't proscribe the teaching of evolution in general, but only the idea that humans had evolved. Be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Tennessee that it shall be unlawful for any teacher in any of the universities, normals, and all other public schools of the state which are supported in whole or in part by the public school funds of the state, to teach any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. While more liberal creationists admit that some species could have evolved from others, all creationists draw the line at humans. The gap between us and other primates, they say, was unbridgeable by evolution and must therefore have involved an act of special creation. The idea that humans are a part of nature has been anathema over most of the history of biology. In 1735, the Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus, who established biological classification, lumped humans, whom he named Homo sapiens, man the wise, with monkeys and apes based on anatomical similarity. Linnaeus didn't suggest an evolutionary relationship between these species, his intention was explicitly to reveal the order behind God's creation. But his decision was still controversial, and he incurred the wrath of his archbishop. A century later, Darwin knew full well the ire he would face by suggesting, as he firmly believed, that humans had evolved from other species. In The Origin, he pussyfooted around the issue, sneaking in one oblique sentence at the end of the book, Light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Darwin didn't come to grips with the issue until more than a decade later in The Descent of Man, 1871. Emboldened by his growing insight and conviction, and by the confidence gained from the rapid acceptance of his ideas, he finally made his views explicit. Mustering evidence from anatomy and behavior, Darwin asserted not only that humans had evolved from ape-like creatures, but did so in Africa. We thus learn that man is descended from a hairy quadruped, furnished with a tail and pointed ears, probably arboreal in its habits, and an inhabitant of the old world. Imagine the effect of that sentence on Victorian ears, to think that our ancestors lived in trees and were furnished with tails and pointed ears. In his last chapter, Darwin finally dealt head-on with the religious objections. I am aware that the conclusions arrived at in this work will be denounced by some as highly irreligious. 
But he who denounces them is bound to show why it is more irreligious to explain the origin of man as a distinct species by descent from some lower form, through the laws of variation and natural selection, than to explain the birth of the individual through the laws of ordinary reproduction, the pattern of development. Nevertheless, he didn't convince all of his colleagues. Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Lyell, Darwin's competitor and mentor, respectively. Both signed on to the idea of evolution, but remained unconvinced that natural selection could explain the higher mental faculties of humans. It took fossils to finally convince the skeptics that humans had indeed evolved. Fossil Ancestors In 1871, the human fossil record comprised only a few bones of the late-appearing Neanderthals, too human-like to count as a missing link between ourselves and apes. They were regarded instead as an aberrant population of Homo sapiens. In 1891, the Dutch physician Eugene Dubois turned up a skull cap, some teeth, and a thigh bone in Java that filled the bill. The skull was somewhat more robust than that of modern humans, and the brain size smaller. But distressed by the religious and scientific opposition to his ideas, Dubois reburied the bones of Pithecanthropus erectus, now called Homo erectus, beneath his house, hiding them from scientific scrutiny for three decades. Dart's 1924 discovery of the Tongs child set off a hunt for human ancestors in Africa, eventually leading to the famous excavations of the Leakies at Olduvai Gorge beginning in the 1930s, the discovery of Lucy by Donald Johansson in 1974, and a host of other finds. We now have a reasonable fossil record of our evolution, although one that's far from complete. There are, as we'll see, many mysteries and more than a few surprises. But even without fossils, we'd still know something about our place on the tree of evolution. As Linnaeus proposed, our anatomy places us in the order primates, along with monkeys, apes, and lemurs, all sharing traits such as forward-facing eyes, fingernails, color vision, and opposable thumbs. Other features put us in the smaller superfamily, hominoidea, along with the lesser apes, gibbons, and great apes, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and ourselves. And within the hominoidea, we are grouped with the great apes in the family hominidae, sharing unique features like flattened fingernails, 32 teeth, enlarged ovaries, and prolonged parental care. These shared characters show that our common ancestor with the great apes lived more recently than our common ancestor with any other mammal. Molecular data derived from DNA and protein sequences confirms these relationships and also tells us roughly when we diverged from our relatives. We are most closely related to the chimpanzees, equally to the common chimp and the bonobo, and we diverged from our joint common ancestor about seven million years ago. The gorilla is a slightly more distant relative, and orangutans more distant yet, twelve million years since the common ancestor. Yet to many, fossil evidence is psychologically more convincing than molecular data. It's one thing to learn that we share 98.5% of our DNA sequence with chimps, but another entirely to see the skeleton of an australopithecine, with its small, ape-like skull perched atop a skeleton nearly identical to that of modern humans. But before we look at the fossils, we can make some predictions about what we'd expect to find if humans evolved from apes. What should our missing link with the apes look like? Remember that the missing link is the single ancestral species that gave rise to modern humans on the one hand and chimpanzees on the other. It's not reasonable to expect the discovery of that critical single species, for its identification would require a complete series of ancestor-descendant fossils on both the chimp and human lineages, series that we could trace back until they intersect at the ancestor. Except for a few marine microorganisms, such complete fossil sequences don't exist. And our early human ancestors were large, relatively few in number compared to grazers like antelopes, and inhabited a small part of Africa under dry conditions not conducive to fossilization. Their fossils, 
like those of all apes and monkeys, are scarce. This resembles our problem with the evolution of birds, for whom transitional fossils are also rare. We can certainly trace the evolution of birds from feathered reptiles, but we're not sure exactly which fossil species were the direct ancestors of modern birds. Given all this, we can't expect to find the single particular species that represents the missing link between humans and other apes. We can hope only to find its evolutionary cousins. Remember also that this common ancestor was not a chimpanzee and probably didn't look like either modern chimps or humans. Nevertheless, it's likely that the missing link was closer in appearance to modern chimps than to modern humans. We are the odd man out in the evolution of modern apes, who all resemble one another far more than they resemble us. Gorillas are our distant cousins, and yet they share with chimps features like relatively small brains, hairiness, knuckle-walking, and large, pointed canine teeth. Gorillas and chimps also have a rectangular dental arcade. When viewed from above, the bottom row of their teeth looks like three sides of a rectangle. See figure 27. Humans are the one species that has diverged from the ape ground plan. We have uniquely flexible thumbs, very little hair, smaller and blunter canine teeth, and we walk erect. Our tooth row is not rectangular but parabolic, as you can see by inspecting your lower teeth in the mirror. Most striking, we have a much larger brain than any ape. The adult chimp's brain has a volume of about 450 cubic centimeters, that of a modern human about 1,450 cubic centimeters. When we compare the similarities of chimps, gorillas, and orangutans to the divergent features of humans, we can conclude that, relative to our common ancestor, we have changed more than have modern apes. Around five to seven million years ago, then, we expect to find fossil ancestors having traits shared by chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas, these traits are shared because they were present in the common ancestor, but with some human features too. As the fossils become more and more recent, we should see brains getting relatively larger, canine teeth becoming smaller, the tooth row becoming less rectangular and more curved, and the posture becoming more erect. And this is exactly what we see. Although far from complete, the record of human evolution is one of the best confirmations we have of an evolutionary prediction, and is especially gratifying because the prediction was Darwin's. But first, a few caveats. We don't, and can't expect to, have a continuous fossil record of human ancestry. Instead, we see a tangled bush of many different species— most of them went extinct without leaving descendants, and only one genetic lineage threaded its way through time to become modern humans. We're not yet sure which fossil species lie along that particular thread and which were evolutionary dead ends. The most surprising thing we've learned about our history is that we've had many close evolutionary cousins who died out without leaving descendants. It's even possible that as many as four human-like species lived in Africa at the same time, and maybe in the same place. Imagine the encounters that might have taken place. Did they kill one another or try to interbreed? And the names of ancestral human fossils can't be taken too seriously. Like theology, paleoanthropology is a field in which the students far outnumber the objects of study. There are lively and sometimes acrimonious debates about whether a given fossil is really something new or merely a variant of an already named species. These arguments about scientific names often mean very little. Whether a human-like fossil is named as one species or another can turn on matters as small as half a millimeter in the diameter of a tooth or slight differences in the shape of the thigh bone. The problem is that there are simply too few specimens spread out over too large a geographic area to make these decisions with any confidence. New finds and revisions of old conclusions occur constantly. What we must keep in sight is the general trend of the fossils over time, which clearly shows a change from ape-like to human-like features. On to the bones. Anthropologists apply the term hominin, to all the species on the human side of our family tree after it split from the branch that became modern chimps.
20 types of hominins have been named as separate species. 15 of these are shown in rough order of appearance in Figure 24. I show the skulls of a few representative hominins in Figure 25, along with those of a modern chimp and human for comparison. Our main question is, of course, how to determine the pattern of human evolution. When do we see the earliest fossils that might represent our ancestors who had already diverged from other apes? Which of our hominin relatives went extinct, and which were our direct ancestors? How did the features of the ancestral ape become those of modern humans? Did our big brain evolve first, or our upright posture? We know that humans began evolving in Africa, but what part of our evolution happened elsewhere? Except for some bone fragments whose classification is unclear, until recently, the hominin fossil record didn't go back beyond four million years. But in 2002, Michel Brunet and his colleagues announced the astounding discovery of an older possible hominin, Sahelanthropus chidensis, from the central African deserts of Chad, the region known as the Sahel. The most surprising thing about this find is its date, between six and seven million years ago, right when molecular evidence tells us that our lineage diverged from that of chimps. Sahelanthropus might well represent the earliest human ancestor, or it could be a side branch that went extinct. But its mix of traits certainly seems to place it on the human side of the human-chimp divide. What we have here is a nearly complete skull, albeit a bit squashed during fossilization, but one that is a mosaic, showing a curious mixture of hominin-like and ape-like traits. Like apes, it had a long cranium with a small, chimp-sized brain, but like later hominins, it had a flat face, small teeth, and brow ridges. Note, see figure 25. Lacking the rest of the skeleton, we can't tell if Sahelanthropus had the critical ability to walk upright, but there is a tantalizing hint that it could. In knuckle walkers like gorillas and chimps, the animal's usual posture is horizontal, so its spinal cord enters the skull from the rear. In erect humans, however, the skull sits directly atop the spinal cord. You can see this difference in the position of the opening in the skull through which the spinal cord passes, the foramen magnum, Latin for big hole. This hole is set farther forward in humans. In Sahelanthropus, the hole is farther forward than in knuckle-walking apes. This is exciting, for if this species really was on the hominin side of the divide, it suggests that bipedal walking was one of the first evolutionary innovations to distinguish us from other apes. After Sahelanthropus, we have a few six-million-year-old fragments from another species, Auroran tugenensis, including a single leg bone that has been interpreted as evidence of bipedality. But then there is a two-million-year gap with no substantive hominin fossils. This is where, one day, we'll find crucial information about when we began to walk upright. But beginning about four million years ago, the fossils reappear, and from them we see branches beginning to sprout from the hominin tree. In fact, several species might have lived at the same time. Among these are the grassel, slender and graceful, australopithecines, which again show mixtures of ape-like and human-like traits. On the ape side, their brains are roughly chimp-sized, and their skulls are more ape-like than human-like. But the teeth are relatively small and set in rows midway between the rectangular shape of apes and the parabolic palate of humans and they were definitely bipedal. An early set of fossils from Kenya, grouped together as Australopithecus anamensis, shows tantalizing hints of bipedality from a single fossilized leg bone. But the decisive find was made by Donald Johansson, an American paleoanthropologist prospecting for fossils in the Afar region of Ethiopia. On the morning of November 30, 1974, Johansson awoke feeling lucky, and made a note to that effect in his field diary. But he had no idea how lucky he'd be. After searching vainly all morning in a dry gully, Johansson and Tom Gray, a graduate student, were about to give up and head back to camp. Suddenly, 
Johansson spotted a hominid bone on the ground, and then another and another. Remarkably, they had stumbled on the bones of a single individual, later formally designated AL-288-1, but more famously known as Lucy, after the Beatles song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds played repeatedly in camp to celebrate the find. When Lucy's hundreds of fragments were assembled, she turned out to be a female of a new species, Australopithecus afarensis, dating back 3.2 million years. She was between 20 and 30 years old, three and a half feet tall, weighing a scant 60 pounds and possibly afflicted with arthritis. But most important, she walked on two legs. How can we tell? From the way that the femur, thigh bone connects to the pelvis at one end and to the knee at its other. Note, see figure 26. In a bipedally walking primate like ourselves, the femurs angle in toward each other from the hips so that the center of gravity stays in one place while walking, allowing an efficient fore and aft bipedal stride. In knuckle-walking apes, the femurs are slightly splayed out, making them bow-legged. When they try to walk upright, they waddle awkwardly, like Charlie Chaplin's little tramp. If you take a primate fossil, then, and look at how the femur fits together with the pelvis, you can tell whether the creature walked on two legs or four. If the femur is angled toward the middle, it's bipedal. And Lucy's angle in at almost the same angle as that of modern humans. She walked upright. Her pelvis, too, resembles that of modern humans far more than that of modern chimps. A team of paleoanthropologists, led by Mary Leakey, confirmed the bipedality of A. afarensis with another remarkable find in Tanzania, the famous Laetoli footprints. In 1976, Andrew Hill and another member of the team were taking a break by indulging in a favorite field pastime, pelting each other with chunks of dried elephant dung. Looking for ammunition in a dry stream bed, Hill stumbled upon a line of fossilized footprints. After careful excavation, the footprints turned out to be an 80-foot trail made by two hominins who had clearly been walking on two legs. There were no impressions of knuckles during an ash storm from an erupting volcano. That storm was followed by a rain which turned the ash into a cement-like layer that was later sealed in by another layer of dry ash preserving the footprints. The Laetoli footprints were virtually identical to those made by modern humans walking on soft ground, and the feet were almost certainly from Lucy's kin. The tracks are the right size, and the trail dates from around 3.6 million years ago, a time when A. afarensis was the only hominin of record. What we have here is that rarest of finds, fossilized human behavior. One of the tracks is larger than the other, so they were probably made by a male and female. Other afarensis fossils have shown sexual dimorphism in size. The female's footprints seem a bit deeper on one side than the other, so she may have been carrying an infant on her hip. The trail evokes visions of a small, hairy couple making their way across the plain during a volcanic eruption. Were they frightened and holding hands? Like other Australopithecines, Lucy had a very ape-like head with a chimp-sized brain case. But her skull shows more human-like traces, too, such as a semi-parabolic tooth row and reduced canine teeth, figures 25 and 27. Between the head and pelvis, she had a mixture of ape-like and human-like traits. The arms were relatively longer than those of modern humans, but shorter than those of chimps and the finger bones were somewhat curved, like those of apes. This has led to the suggestion that afarensis might have spent at least some time in the trees. One could not ask for a better transitional form between humans and ancient apes than Lucy. From the neck up, she's ape-like. In the middle, she's a mixture. And from the waist down, she's almost a modern human. And she tells us a critical fact about our evolution— our upright posture evolved long before our big brain. When this was discovered, it went against the conventional wisdom that larger brains evolved first and made us rethink the way that natural selection may have shaped modern humans.
After A. afarensis, the fossil record shows a confusing melange of grassal australopithecine species lasting up to about two million years ago. Viewed chronologically, they show a progression to a more modern human form. The tooth row gets more parabolic, the brain gets larger, and the skeleton loses its ape-like features. Then things get even messier. For two million years ago marks the borderline between fossils placed in the genus Australopithecus and those placed in the more modern genus Homo. We shouldn't think, though, that this change of names means that something momentous happened, that real humans suddenly evolved. Whether a fossil is called one name or another depends on whether it has a larger Homo or smaller Australopithecus brain usually with a somewhat arbitrary cutoff of around 600 cubic centimeters. Some Australopithecine fossils, like A. rudolfensis, appear so intermediate in brain size that scientists argue hotly about whether they should be called Homo or Australopithecus. This naming problem is compounded by the fact that even within a single species, we see considerable variation in brain size. Modern humans, for example, span a very wide range, between 1,000 and 2,000 cubic centimeters, which doesn't, by the way, correlate with intelligence. But the semantic difficulties shouldn't distract us from realizing that the late Australopithecines, already bipedal, were beginning to show changes in teeth, skull, and brain that presage modern humans. It is very likely that the lineage that gave rise to modern humans included at least one of these species. Another great leap forward in human evolution was the ability to make and use tools. Although chimpanzees use simple tools, including sticks to extract termites from their mounds, using more elaborate tools probably required more flexible thumbs and an erect posture that freed the hands. The first unequivocally tool-using human was Homo habilis, figure 25, whose remains first appear about 2.5 million years ago. H. habilis means handyman, and his fossils are associated with a variety of flaked stone tools used for chopping, scraping, and butchering. We're not sure if this species was a direct ancestor of H. sapiens, but habilis does show changes toward a more human-like condition including reduced back teeth and a brain larger than that of the Australopithecines. A cast of one brain shows distinct swellings corresponding to Broca's area and Wernicke's area, parts of the brain's left lobe associated with speech production and comprehension. These bumps raise the possibility, still far from certain, that Habilis was the first species with spoken language. We do know that H. Habilis coexisted, in time, if not in space, with a whole host of other hominins. The most famous are the East African robust, as opposed to gracile, hominins. There were at least three of these. Paranthropus, or Australopithecus, Boise, figure 25, P. robustus, and P. ethiopicus, all with massive skulls, heavy chewing teeth, some of the molars were nearly an inch across, sturdy bones and relatively small brains. They also sported sagittal crests, a ridge of bone atop the skull that anchored large chewing muscles. Such robust species probably subsisted on coarse food like roots, nuts, and tubers. P. Boise, discovered by Louis Leakey, was nicknamed Nutcracker Man. All three species went extinct by 1.1 million years ago, leaving no descendants but H. habilis may have lived alongside three species of Homo as well, H. ergaster, H. rudolfensis, and H. erectus, although each of these species shows considerable variation and their relationships are disputed. H. erectus, upright man, holds the distinction of being the first hominin to leave Africa. Its remains have been found in China, Peking man, Indonesia, Java man, Europe and the Middle East. It is likely that as its populations in Africa expanded, Erectus simply sought new places to live. By the time of this diaspora, the brain size of Erectus was nearly equal to that of modern humans. Their skeletons were also nearly identical to ours, though they still had a flattened, chinless face, 
the chin is a hallmark of modern H. sapiens. Their tools were complex, particularly those of late Erectus, who fashioned complex stone axes and scrapers with intricate flaking. The species also seems responsible for one of the most momentous events in human cultural history, the control of fire. In a cave at Swartkrans in South Africa, scientists found erectus remains alongside burned bones, bones heated at a temperature too high to have come from a brush fire. These could be the remains of animals cooked over a campfire or hearth. H. erectus was a highly successful species, not only in population size but in longevity. It was around for one and a half million years, disappearing from the fossil record about 300,000 years ago. It may, though, have left two famous descendants, H. heidelbergensis and H. neanderthalensis, known respectively as archaic H. sapiens and the famous Neanderthal man. Both of these are sometimes classified as subspecies, differentiated but interbreeding populations, of H. sapiens, though we have no idea whether either contributed to the gene pool of modern humans. Living in what is now Germany, Greece, and France, as well as Africa, H. heidelbergensis first appears half a million years ago, showing a mixture of modern human and H. erectus features. Neanderthals show up a bit later, 230,000 years ago, and lived all over Europe and the Middle East. They had large brains, even bigger than those of modern humans, and were excellent toolmakers, as well as adept hunters. Some skeletons bear traces of the pigment ochre, and are accompanied by grave goods, such as animal bones and tools. This suggests that Neanderthals ceremonially buried their dead, perhaps the first inkling of human religion. But around 28,000 years ago, the Neanderthal fossils vanish. When I was a student, I was taught that they simply evolved into modern humans. This idea now seems incorrect. What really happened to them is arguably the biggest unknown about human evolution. Their disappearance may have been associated with the spread of another form originating in Africa, Homo sapiens. As we learned, by about 1.5 million years ago, H. erectus had spread all the way from Africa to Indonesia. And within this species there were different races, that is, populations that differed in some of their traits. H. erectus from China, for example, had shovel-shaped incisor teeth not seen in other populations. Then, about 60,000 years ago, every H. erectus population suddenly vanished and was replaced by fossils of anatomically modern H. sapiens, who had skeletons nearly identical to those of living humans. Neanderthals hung on a while longer, but then, after finding a last redoubt in caves overlooking the Strait of Gibraltar, they too gave way to modern H. sapiens. In other words, Homo sapiens apparently elbowed out every other hominin on Earth. What happened? There are two theories. The first, called the multi-regional theory, proposes an evolutionary replacement— H. erectus and perhaps H. neanderthalensis simply evolved into H. sapiens independently in several areas, perhaps because natural selection was acting in the same way all over Asia, Europe, and Africa. The second idea, dubbed the out-of-Africa theory, proposes that modern H. sapiens originated in Africa and spread, physically replacing H. erectus and the Neanderthals, perhaps by outcompeting them for food or killing them. Genetic and fossil evidence supports the out-of-Africa theory, but the debate continues. Why? Probably because it boils down to the significance of race. The longer human populations have been separated, the more genetic differences they will have accumulated. The multi-regional hypothesis, with its splitting of populations over a million years ago, would predict fifteen times more genetic difference between races than if our human ancestors left Africa only sixty thousand years ago. But more about race later. One population of earlier hominins may have survived the worldwide extinction of H. erectus, and it is perhaps the most bizarre twig on the human family tree. <laughs> 
Discovered in 2003 on the island of Flores in Indonesia, individuals of Homo floresiensis were promptly dubbed hobbits, for their adult height was a scant one meter, 39 inches, and they weighed only 50 pounds, roughly the size of a five-year-old child. Their brains were also proportionately small, about Australopithecine size, but their teeth and skeletons were indisputably those of Homo. They used stone tools and may have preyed on the Komodo dragons and dwarf elephants that populated the island. Amazingly, Floresiensis fossils date to a mere 18,000 years ago, well after Neanderthals disappeared and 25 centuries after modern H. sapiens had already reached Australia. The best guess is that Floresiensis represents an isolated population of H. erectus that colonized Flores and was somehow bypassed by the spread of modern H. sapiens. Although Floresiensis was probably an evolutionary dead end, it is hard not to be charmed by the idea of a recent population of tiny humans who hunted dwarf elephants with miniature spears, and the hobbits have drawn wide public interest. But the nature of the Floresiensis fossils is disputed. Some contend that the tiny size of the one well-preserved skull may simply represent a diseased individual of modern Homo sapiens, perhaps one suffering from hypothyroid cretinism, a condition producing abnormally small skulls and brains. Recent analysis of fossil wrist bones, however, do support H. floresiensis as a genuine species of hominin, but questions remain. Looking at the whole array of bones, then, what do we have? Clearly, indisputable evidence for human evolution from ape-like ancestors. Granted, we can't yet trace out a continuous lineage from an ape-like early hominin to modern Homo sapiens. The fossils are scattered in time and space, a series of dots yet to be genealogically connected. And we may never have enough fossils to join them. But if you put those dots in chronological order, as in figure 24, you see exactly what Darwin predicted. Fossils that start off ape-like and become more and more like modern humans as time passes. It's a fact that our divergence from the ancestor of chimps occurred in East or Central Africa about seven million years ago, and that bipedal walking evolved well before the evolution of large brains. We know that during much of hominin evolution, several species existed at the same time, sometimes at the same place. Given the small population size of humans and the improbability of their fossilization, remember this usually requires that a body find its way into water and be quickly covered with sediment. It's amazing that we have as good a record as we do. It seems impossible to survey the fossils we have or look at figure 25 and deny that humans have evolved. Yet some still do. When dealing with the human fossil record, creationists go through extreme, indeed almost humorous contortions to avoid admitting the obvious. In fact, they'd prefer to steer clear of the issue but when forced to confront it, they simply sort hominin fossils into what they see as two discrete groups, humans and apes, and assert that these groups are separated by a large and unbridgeable gap. This reflects their religiously based view that although some species may have evolved from others, humans did not, but were the object of a special act of creation. But the whole folly is exposed by the fact that creationists can't agree on exactly which fossils are human and which are ape. Specimens of H. habilis and H. erectus, for example, are classified as apes by some creationists and humans by others. One author has even described a H. erectus specimen as an ape in one of his books and a human in another. Nothing shows the intermediacy of these fossils better than the inability of creationists to classify them consistently. What then propelled the evolution of humans? It's always easier to document evolutionary change than to understand the forces behind it. What we see in the human fossil record is the appearance of complex adaptations such as erect posture and remodeled skulls, both of which involve many coordinated changes in anatomy, so there's no doubt that natural selection was involved. But what sort of selection? 
What were the precise reproductive advantages of larger brains, erect posture, and smaller teeth? We'll probably never know for sure, and can only make more or less plausible guesses. We can, however, inform these guesses by learning something about the environment in which humans evolved. Between ten and three million years ago, the most profound environmental change in East and Central Africa was drought. During this critical period of hominin evolution, the climate gradually became drier and was later followed by alternating and erratic periods of drought and rainfall. This information comes from pollen and African dust blown into the ocean and preserved in sediments. During the dry periods, the rainforests gave way to more open habitat, including savanna, grassland, open forest, and even desert scrub. This is the stage on which the first act of human evolution played out. Many biologists feel that these changes in climate and environment had something to do with the first significant hominin trait to evolve, bipedality. The classic explanation is that walking on two legs allowed humans to travel more efficiently from one patch of forest to another across newly open habitat. But this seems unlikely because studies of knuckle-walking and bipedality show that these forms of locomotion don't use significantly different amounts of energy. Still, there are a host of other reasons why walking erect may have had a selective advantage. It could, for instance, have freed the hands to gather and carry newly available types of food, including meat and tubers. This could also explain our smaller teeth and increased manual dexterity. Walking erect could also have helped us deal with high temperature by raising our body off the ground, reducing the surface area exposed to the sun. We have far more sweat glands than any other ape, and since hair interferes with the cooling evaporation of sweat, this may explain our unique status as naked apes. There is even an improbable aquatic ape theory, arguing that early hominins spent much of their time foraging for food in the water with erect posture evolving to keep our heads above the surface. Jonathan Kingdon's book on bipedality, Lowly Origin, describes still more theories. And of course, these evolutionary forces are not mutually exclusive. Several might have been operating together. Unfortunately, we can't yet distinguish among them. The same goes for the evolution of increased brain size. The classic adaptive story is that once our hands were freed by the evolution of two-legged walking, hominins were able to fashion tools, leading to selection for bigger brains that allowed us to envision and fashion more complex tools. This theory has the advantage that the first tool appeared around the time that brains started getting larger. But it ignores other selective pressures for bigger and more complex brains, including the development of language, negotiating the psychological intricacies of primitive society, planning for the future, and so on. These mysteries about how we evolved should not distract us from the indisputable fact that we did evolve. Even without fossils, we have evidence of human evolution from comparative anatomy, embryology, our vestigial traits, and even biogeography. We've learned of our fish-like embryos, our dead genes, our transitory fetal coat of hair, and our poor design, all testifying to our origins. The fossil record is really the icing on the cake. Our Genetic Heritage If we don't yet understand why selection made us different from other apes, can we at least find out how many and what sort of genes differentiate us? Humanness genes have become almost a holy grail of evolutionary biology, with many laboratories engaged in the search. The first attempt to find them was made in 1975 by Alan Wilson and Mary Claire King at the University of California. Their results were surprising. Looking at protein sequences taken from humans and chimps, they found that they differed on average by only about 1%. More recent work hasn't changed this figure much. The difference has risen to about 1.5%. King and Wilson concluded that there was a remarkable genetic similarity between us and our closest relatives. 
They speculated that perhaps changes in just a very few genes produced the striking evolutionary differences between humans and chimps. This result garnered tremendous publicity in both the popular and scientific press, for it seemed to imply that humanness rested on just a handful of key mutations. But recent work shows that our genetic resemblance to our evolutionary cousins is not quite as close as we thought. Consider this. A 1.5% difference in protein sequence means that when we line up the same protein, say hemoglobin, of humans and chimps, on average we'll see a difference at just one out of every hundred amino acids. But proteins are typically composed of several hundred amino acids. So a 1.5% difference in a protein 300 amino acids long translates into about four differences in the total protein sequence. To use an analogy, if you change only 1% of the letters on this page, you will alter far more than 1% of the sentences. That oft-quoted 1.5% difference between ourselves and chimps, then, is really larger than it looks. A lot more than 1.5% of our proteins will differ by at least one amino acid from the sequence in chimps. And since proteins are essential for building and maintaining our bodies, a single difference can have substantial effects. Now that we finally sequence the genomes of both chimp and human, we can see directly that more than 80% of all the proteins shared by the two species differ in at least one amino acid. Since our genomes have about 25,000 protein-making genes, that translates to a difference in the sequence of more than 20,000 of them. That's not a trivial divergence. Obviously, more than a few genes distinguish us. And molecular evolutionists have recently found that humans and chimps differ not only in the sequence of genes, but also in the presence of genes. More than 6% of genes found in humans simply aren't found in any form in chimpanzees. There are over 1,400 novel genes expressed in humans but not in chimps. We also differ from chimps in the number of copies of many genes that we do share. The salivary enzyme amylase, for example, acts in the mouth to break down starch into digestible sugar. Chimps have but a single copy of the gene, while individual humans have between 2 and 16, with an average of 6 copies. This difference probably resulted from natural selection to help us digest our food, as the ancestral human diet was probably much richer in starch than that of fruit-eating apes. Putting this together, we see that the genetic divergence between ourselves and chimpanzees comes in several forms. Changes not only in the proteins produced by genes, but also in the presence or absence of genes, the number of gene copies, and when and where genes are expressed during development. We can no longer claim that humanness rests on only one type of mutation, or changes in only a few key genes. But this is not really surprising if you think about the many traits that distinguish us from our closest relatives. There are differences not only in anatomy, but also in physiology. We are the sweatiest of apes, and the only ape whose females have concealed ovulation. Behavior. Humans pair bond and other apes do not. Language and brain size and configuration. Surely there must be many differences in how the neurons in our brains are hooked up. Despite our general resemblance to our primate cousins then, evolving a human from an ape-like ancestor probably required substantial genetic change. Can we say anything about the specific genes that did make us human? Right now, not very much. Using genomic scans that compare the entire DNA sequence of chimps and humans, we can pick out classes of genes that have evolved rapidly on the human branch of our divergence. These happen to include genes involved in the immune system, gamete formation, cell death, and most intriguingly, sensory perception and nerve formation but it's a different matter entirely to zero in on a single gene and demonstrate that mutations in that gene actually produced human-chimp differences. There are candidate genes of this sort, including one, FOXP2, that might have been involved in the appearance of human speech. But the evidence is inconclusive, 
and it might always remain so. Conclusive proof that a given gene causes human chimp differences requires moving the gene from one species to another and seeing what difference it makes, and that's not the kind of experiment anyone would want to try. The Sticky Question of Race Traveling around the globe, you quickly see that humans from different places look different. Nobody, for example, would mistake a Japanese for a Finn. The existence of visibly different human types is obvious, but there's no bigger minefield in human biology than the question of race. Most biologists stay as far away from it as they can. A look at the history of science tells us why. From the beginning of modern biology, racial classification has gone hand in hand with racial prejudice. In his 18th century classification of animals, Carl Linnaeus noted that Europeans are governed by laws, Asians governed by opinions, and Africans governed by caprice. In his superb book, the Mismeasure of Man, Stephen J. Gould documents the unholy connection between biologists and race in the last century. In response to these distasteful episodes of racism, some scientists have overreacted, arguing that human races have no biological reality and are merely socio-political constructs that don't merit scientific study. But to biologists, Race, so long as it doesn't apply to humans, has always been a perfectly respectable term. Races, also called subspecies or ecotypes, are simply populations of a species that are both geographically separated and differ genetically in one or more traits. There are plenty of animal and plant races, including those mouse populations that differ only in coat color, sparrow populations that differ in size and song, and plant races that differ in the shape of their leaves. Following this definition, Homo sapiens clearly does have races, and the fact that we do is just another indication that we don't differ from other evolved species. The existence of different races in humans shows that our populations were geographically separated long enough to allow some genetic divergence to occur. But how much divergence, and does it fit with what the fossils indicate about our spread from Africa? And what kind of selection drove those differences? As we would expect from evolution, human physical variation occurs in nested groups, and in spite of valiant efforts by some to create formal divisions of race, exactly where one draws the line to demarcate a particular race is completely arbitrary. There are no sharp boundaries. The number of races recognized by anthropologists has ranged from three to more than thirty. Looking at genes shows even more clearly the lack of sharp differences between races. Virtually all the genetic variation uncovered by modern molecular techniques correlates only weakly with the classical combinations of physical traits such as skin color and hair type commonly used to determine race. Direct genetic evidence, accumulated over the last three decades, shows that only about 10 to 15 percent of all genetic variation in humans is represented by differences between races that are recognized by differences in physical appearance. The remainder of the genetic variation, 85 to 90 percent, occurs among individuals within races. What this means is that races don't show all or none differences in the forms of genes, alleles, that they carry. Instead, they usually have the same alleles but in different frequencies. The ABO blood group gene, for example, has three alleles, A, B, and O. Almost all human populations have these three forms, but they are present in different frequencies in different groups. The O allele, for example, has a frequency of 54% in Japanese, 64% in Finns, 74% in South African Kung, and 85% in Navajos. This is typical of the kind of differences we see in DNA. You can't diagnose a person's origin from a single gene alone, but must do so from looking at a combination of many genes. At the genetic level, then, human beings are a remarkably similar lot.
That is just what we would expect if modern humans left Africa a mere 60,000 or 100,000 years ago. There has been little time for genetic divergence, although we have spread to all corners of the world, breaking up into various far-flung populations that were genetically isolated until recent decades. So does this mean that we can ignore human race? No. These conclusions don't mean that races are merely mental constructs or that the small genetic differences between them are uninteresting. Some racial differences give us clear evidence of evolutionary pressures that acted in different areas and can be useful in medicine. Sickle cell anemia, for example, is most common in blacks whose ancestors came from equatorial Africa. Because carriers of the sickle cell mutation have some resistance to falciparium malaria, the deadliest form of the disease. It's likely that the high frequency of this mutation in African and African-derived populations resulted from natural selection in response to malaria. Tay-Sachs disease is a fatal genetic disorder that is common among both Ashkenazi Jews and the Cajuns of Louisiana, probably reaching high frequencies via genetic drift in small ancestral populations. Knowing one's ethnicity is a tremendous help in diagnosing these and other genetically based diseases. Moreover, the differences in allele frequencies between racial groups mean that finding appropriate organ donors, which requires a match between several compatibility genes, should take race into account. Most of the genetic differences between races are trivial, and yet others like those physical differences between a Japanese individual and a Finn, a Maasai and an Inuit are striking. We have the interesting situation, then, that the overall differences in gene sequences between peoples are minor, yet those same groups show dramatic differences in a range of visually apparent traits, such as skin color, hair color, body form, and nose shape. These obvious physical differences are not characteristic of the genome as a whole, so why has the small amount of divergence that has occurred between human populations become focused on such visually striking traits? Some of these differences make sense as adaptations to the different environments in which early humans found themselves. The darker skin of tropical groups probably provides protection from intense ultraviolet light that produces lethal melanomas while the pale skin of higher latitude groups allows penetration of light necessary for the synthesis of essential vitamin D, which helps prevent rickets and tuberculosis. But what about the eye folds of Asians, or the longer noses of Caucasians? These don't have any obvious connection to the environment. For some biologists, the existence of greater variation between races and genes that affect physical appearance something easily assessed by potential mates, points to one thing. Sexual selection. Apart from the characteristic pattern of genetic variation, there are other grounds for considering sexual selection as a strong driving force for the evolution of races. We are unique among species for having developed complex cultures. Language has given us a remarkable ability to disseminate ideas and opinions, a group of humans can change their culture much faster than they can evolve genetically. But the cultural change can also produce genetic change. Imagine that a spreading idea or fad involves the preferred appearance of one's mate. An empress in Asia, for example, might have a penchant for men with straight black hair and almond-shaped eyes. By creating a fashion, her preference spreads culturally to all her female subjects, and, lo and behold, over time the curly-haired and round-eyed individuals will be largely replaced by individuals with straight black hair and almond-shaped eyes. It is this gene-culture co-evolution, the idea that a change in cultural environment leads to new types of selection on genes, that makes the idea of sexual selection for physical differences especially appealing. Moreover, sexual selection can often act incredibly fast, making it an ideal candidate for driving the rapid evolutionary differentiation of physical traits that occurred since the most recent migration of our ancestors from Africa. Of course, all this is just speculation and nearly impossible to test.
but it potentially explains certain puzzling differences between groups. Nevertheless, most controversy about race centers not on physical differences between populations, but behavioral ones. Has evolution caused certain races to become smarter, more athletic, or cannier than others? We have to be especially careful here, because unsubstantiated claims in this area can give racism a scientific cachet. So what do the scientific data say? Almost nothing. Although different populations may have different behaviors, different IQs, and different abilities, it's hard to rule out the possibility that these differences are a non-genetic product of environmental or cultural differences. If we want to determine whether certain differences between races are based on genes, we must rule out these influences. Such studies require controlled experiments, removing infants of different ethnicity from their parents and bringing them up in identical or randomized environments. What behavioral differences remain would be genetic. Because these experiments are unethical, they haven't been done systematically. But cross-cultural adoptions anecdotally show that cultural influences on behavior are strong. As the psychologist Steven Pinker noted, if you adopt children from a technologically undeveloped part of the world, they will fit into modern society just fine. That suggests, at least, that races don't show big innate differences in behavior. My guess, and this is just informed speculation, is that human races are too young to have evolved important differences in intellect and behavior nor is there any reason to think that natural or sexual selection has favored this sort of difference. In the next chapter, we'll learn about the many universal behaviors seen in all human societies, behaviors like symbolic language, childhood fear of strangers, envy, gossip, and gift-giving. If these universals have any genetic basis, their presence in every society adds additional weight to the view that evolution hasn't produced substantial psychological divergence among human groups. Although certain traits like skin color and hair type have diverged among populations, these appear to be special cases, driven by environmental differences between localities or by sexual selection for external appearance. The DNA data shows that, overall, Genetic differences among human populations are minor. It's more than a soothing platitude to say that we're all brothers and sisters under the skin. And that's just what we'd expect, given the brief evolutionary span since our most recent origin in Africa. What about now? Although selection doesn't seem to have produced major differences between races, it has produced some intriguing differences between populations within ethnic groups. Since these populations are quite young, it is clear evidence that selection has acted in humans within recent times. One case involves our ability to digest lactose, a sugar found in milk. An enzyme called lactase breaks down this sugar into the more easily absorbed sugars glucose and galactose, we are born with the ability to digest milk, of course, for that's always been the main food of infants. But after we're weaned, we gradually stop producing lactase. Eventually, many of us entirely lose our ability to digest lactose, becoming lactose intolerant and prone to diarrhea, bloating, and cramps after eating dairy products. The disappearance of lactase after weaning is probably the result of natural selection. Our ancient ancestors had no source of milk after weaning, so why produce a costly enzyme when it's not needed? But in some human populations, individuals continue to produce lactase throughout adulthood, giving them a rich source of nutrition unavailable to others. It turns out that lactase persistence is found mainly in populations that were, or still are, pastoralists, that is, populations who raise cows. These include some European and Middle Eastern populations, as well as Africans such as Maasai and Tutsi. Genetic analysis shows that the persistence of lactase in these populations depends on a simple change in the DNA that regulates the enzyme, keeping it turned on beyond infancy. There are two alleles of the gene, 
the tolerant, on- and intolerant, off form, and they differ in only a single letter of their DNA code. The frequency of the tolerant allele correlates well with whether populations use cows. It's high, 50 to 90 percent in pastoralist populations of Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, and very low, 1 to 20 percent in Asian and African populations that depend on agriculture rather than milk. Archaeological evidence shows that humans began domesticating cows between 7,000 and 9,000 years ago in Sudan, and the practice spread into sub-Saharan Africa and Europe a few thousand years later. The nice part of this story is that we can, from DNA sequencing, determine when the tolerant allele arose by mutation. That time, between 3,000 and 8,000 years ago, fits remarkably well with the rise of pastoralism. What's even nicer is that DNA extracted from 7,000-year-old European skeletons showed that they were lactose intolerant, as we'd expect if they weren't yet pastoral. The evolution of lactose tolerance is another splendid example of gene culture coevolution. A purely cultural change, the raising of cows, perhaps for meat, produced a new evolutionary opportunity, the ability to use those cows for milk. Given the sudden availability of a rich new source of food, ancestors possessing the tolerance gene must have had a substantial reproductive advantage over those carrying the intolerant gene. In fact, we can calculate this advantage by observing how fast the tolerance gene increased to the frequency seen in modern populations. It turns out that tolerant individuals must have produced, on average, 4 to 10 percent more offspring than those who were intolerant. That is pretty strong selection. Anybody who teaches human evolution is inevitably asked, Are we still evolving? The examples of lactose tolerance and duplication of the amylase gene show that selection has certainly acted within the last few thousand years. But what about right now? It's hard to give a good answer. Certainly many types of selection that challenged our ancestors no longer apply. Improvements in nutrition, sanitation, and medical care have done away with many diseases and conditions that killed our ancestors and removed previously potent sources of natural selection. As the British geneticist Steve Jones notes, 500 years ago a British infant had only a 50% chance of survival to reproductive age a figure that has now risen to 99%. And for those who do survive, medical intervention has allowed many to lead normal lives who would have been ruthlessly culled by selection over most of our evolutionary history. How many people with bad eyes or bad teeth, unable to hunt or chew, would have perished on the African savanna? I would certainly have been among the unfit. How many of us have had infections that, without antibiotics, would have killed us, it's likely that, due to cultural change, we are going downhill genetically in many ways. That is, genes that once were detrimental are no longer so bad. We can compensate for bad genes with a simple pair of eyeglasses or a good dentist. And these genes can persist in populations. Conversely, genes that were once useful may, due to cultural change, now have destructive effects. Our love of sweets and fats, for example, may well have been adaptive in our ancestors, for whom such treats were a valuable but rare source of energy. But these once rare foods are now readily available, and so our genetic heritage brings us tooth decay, obesity, and heart problems. 2. Our tendency to lay on fat from rich food may also have been adaptive during times when variation in local food abundance produced a feast or famine situation giving a selective advantage to those who are able to store up calories for lean times. Does this mean that we're really de-evolving? To some degree, yes. But we're probably also becoming more adapted to modern environments that create new types of selection. We should remember that so long as people die before they've stopped reproducing, and so long as some people leave more offspring than others, there is an opportunity for natural selection to improve us, and if there is genetic variation that affects our ability to survive and leave children, 
it will promote evolutionary change. That is certainly happening now. Although pre-reproductive mortality is low in some Western populations, it's high in many other places, especially Africa, where child mortality can exceed 25%. And that mortality is often caused by infectious diseases such as cholera, typhoid fever, and tuberculosis. Other diseases like malaria and AIDS continue to kill many children and adults of reproductive age. The sources of mortality are there, and so are the genes that alleviate them. Variant alleles of some enzymes, for example hemoglobin, notably the sickle cell allele, confer resistance to malaria. And there is one mutant gene, an allele called CCR Delta 32, that provides its carriers with strong protection against infection with the AIDS virus. We can predict that if AIDS continues as a significant source of mortality, the frequency of this allele will rise in affected populations. That's evolution, as surely as is antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And there are undoubtedly other sources of mortality that we don't fully understand. Toxins, pollution, stress, and the like. If we've learned anything from breeding experiments, it is that nearly every species has genetic variation to respond to nearly any form of selection. Slowly, inexorably, and invisibly, our genome adapts to many new sources of mortality, but not every source. Conditions that have both genetic and environmental causes, including obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, may not respond to selection because the mortality they produce occurs mostly after their victims have stopped reproducing. Survival of the fittest is accompanied by survival of the fattest. But people don't care that much about disease resistance, important as it is. They want to know whether humans are getting stronger, smarter, or prettier. That, of course, depends on whether these traits are associated with differential reproduction, and this we just don't know. Nor does it much matter. In our rapidly changing culture, social improvements enhance our abilities far more than any changes in our genes, unless, that is, we decide to tinker with our evolution through genetic manipulations like pre-selecting favorable sperm and eggs. The lesson from the human fossil record, then, combined with more recent discoveries in human genetics, confirms that we are evolved mammals, proud and accomplished ones, to be sure but mammals built by the same processes that transformed every form of life over the past few billion years. Like all species, we are not an end product of evolution, but a work in progress, though our own genetic progress may be slow. And though we have come a long way from ancestral apes, the marks of our heritage still betray us. Gilbert and Sullivan joked that we are just depilated monkeys, Darwin was not as funny, but far more lyrical and truthful. I have given the evidence to the best of my ability, and we must acknowledge, as it seems to me, that man, with all his noble qualities, with sympathy which feels for the most debased, with benevolence which extends not only to other men, but to the humblest living creature, with his godlike intellect which has penetrated into the movements and constitution of the solar system. With all these exalted powers, man still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin.